I'm sure you can hear me from here. It's good to have you all. I thought we'd open with a prayer from our one and only Padre Collins. So let's give him a round of applause for the Holy Spirit. I don't know what kind of day you've had, but um, I've had one. Um, would you indulge me, please? Our time together um, might be a little bit better. We might be a little bit better. If we took just, just a moment for um, a silent 60. A silent 60, please. I'll watch the wrist, my wristwatch. 60 seconds. Just stillness and quiet. Grateful and hopeful. Maybe it'll tell me pay for the column by the word. <laughs> good. <laughs> Friends, it's good to welcome you back. It's good to have us all here in a room together to do what a university is supposed to do to reflect. Um, this is, of course, our semesterly laundering lecture where we invite scholars uh, from around the country and from within our own university to uh, provoke in us insights to raise questions for understanding and for reflection. And we are delighted to welcome today Dr. Jennifer Sanders from St. Louis University. Uh, Jen has a BA and MA in philosophy and a PhD in systematic theology from Boston College. Her areas of research include the thought of Thomas Aquinas and that of Bernard Lonergan, especially in their contributions to Trinitarian theology and soteriology, which is how to make sure you go to the good place and not the other place. <laughs> Uh, she has two recent publications that relate to her talk today. Great title, by the way. Just imitating the Divine Interruption of Deteriorating Human Conversations. Speaking the Gospel in a New Language in Theological Studies this past year. And her forthcoming Nonviolence and Moral Conversion. Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Bernard Lonergan on Social Transformation. She is currently, and somewhat recently, the Mooney Professor of Catholic Studies at St. Louis University. And her talk this afternoon is entitled, Martin Luther King Jr. and Bernard Lonergan, How to Love Everyone, Even Your Enemies. As we can all tell from the title, the talk takes up an important and timely theme by putting two unlikely figures in conversation with one another, a French-Canadian Jesuit priest and an African-American activist and civil rights leader. Using both Bernard Lonergan and Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Sanders will present us with the argument, and I know this because I've read it, <laughs> that nonviolence is not only an option, not only a good option, but in fact a necessary option in the sustainable transformation of socio and historical realities. After Dr. Sanders gives us her reflections, we'll invite two respondents to respond to Jen's talk and to invite us into conversation with the three of them. The first is our very own Dr. Si doctor Sister, or Sister Doctor, what do you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> our beloved Sister Bosco, uh, master's degrees in social communication and diplomacy and international relations, two different master's degrees, and a PhD in communication and sociology. She is a faculty member in our College of Communication and the Arts here at Seton Hall, 
Our second respondent will be Dr. Jonathan Heaps, theologian and scholar, and I can tell you a particularly gifted writer. Uh, John has master's degrees in philosophy uh, and theology from Boston College and Boston University and a PhD in systematic theology from Marquette University. He specializes in the thought of Lonergan and has a forthcoming book with CUA Press. You're very excited to read. So without further ado, Dr. Jen Sanders. Pull the mic down. Pull the mic down. Okay. There we go. Better? Yes. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, first off, thank you. Uh, it's a joy to be here with you. Thank you very much uh, to Greg and Matt for having me. In 1963, two remarkable reflections were penned. One in a jail cell in Birmingham by a civil rights activist the other by a Jesuit priest in Montreal. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail is the defense par excellence of nonviolent activism as a practical, moral, and even Christian means of social change. Bernard Lonergan's mediation of Christ in prayer is a profound exploration of what it means for Christ to be mediator. Dr. King focuses on the role of self-perfection in preparing activists to, quote, present their very bodies, unquote, as the climatic alternative dramatic action in nonviolent movements. Lonergan places Christ's decision to present his very body on the cross in the context of a truly mutual self-mediation, that is, quote, the mutual becoming of a fully autonomous subject through self-discovery and self-commitment which happens through another, end quote. Two centerpieces of King's nonviolent activism and of Lonergan's soteriology, Christ's command to love enemies and the commitment to redemptive suffering, have been criticized as, for example, unjust demands, resentment values, or impractical ideals. For example, some womenist theologians think King's view of redemptive suffering, quote, makes victims the servants of the evildoer's salvation, end quote. Dolores Williams questions whether King's commitment to redemptive suffering, quote, leads women to passively accept their own oppression, end quote. Philosophers such as Friedrich Nietzsche claim Christian morality is a slave morality that deceptively makes its own cowardice into a virtue. Some of King's contemporaries, like black, future black power leader Stokely Carmichael, accused King of naivete about nonviolence and challenged the assumption that civil rights could be achieved by appealing to the conscience of white people. These criticisms are both valuable and necessary insofar as they resist further victimization or oppression. At the same time, it is possible for enemy love and suffering to become concrete methods for actively resisting evil and transforming unjust social situations. As Lugita Rizlipte advises, the major criteria when making decisions about whether or not to absorb evil, for example, through enemy love and suffering, are whether this absorption of evil, this absorption leads to evil's transformation into good, and further, whether this absorption is a free and responsible decision. In nonviolence, the condition of the possibility of such a decision is that the nonviolent activist knows herself as loved. This is a self-knowledge won through mutual self-mediation in reference to God, when someone comes to value herself as God values her, that is, as a beloved child of God. I bring these two 1963 essays together to argue that nonviolence is necessary to sustainable socio-historical transformation. Ultimately, nonviolence mediates the immediacy of unrestricted being and love into human history. And it does so by helping both the oppressed and the oppressor transcend, each in their own way, their contracted horizons. It does so by creating conditions in which each is asked to become herself in relation to the other, 
drawing them toward a genuinely universal self-becoming. It is this universality that makes nonviolence and enemy love genuine principles of recovery in human history and resists the reduction of Jesus' command to passive resignation to evil or its devolution into resentment. To argue that nonviolence and enemy love set the conditions for a genuinely universal self-mediation that resists further dehumanization of the oppressed, I begin with an overview of King's nonviolence and of Lonergan's notion of mutual self-mediation. I then demonstrate how nonviolence supports the orderly unfolding of becoming free and genuine human subjects through the most unlikely of others, one's so-called enemy, and so presents us with a universal self-mediation which is a principle of recovery in human history. In 1962, Dr. King delivered a speech in which he distinguished integration from desegregation. As he writes, quote, we must always be aware of the fact that our ultimate goal is integration and that desegregation is only a first step on the road to a good society, end quote. Desegregation is merely a limited and negative, simply removing social and legal prohibitions. It leads to, quote, physical proximity without spiritual affinity, end quote. Integration, however, is creative and positive because it is genuinely interpersonal. Despite these differences, desegregation is important for breaking down the legal barriers, keeping people physically apart, to, quote, provide the contact and confrontation necessary by which integration is made possible and attainable, end quote. Nevertheless, unlike desegregation, integration is an unenforceable obligation because it concerns, quote, inner attitudes, genuine person-to-person -person relations, and expressions of compassion which law books cannot regulate and jails cannot rectify, end quote. Such an obligation can be met only by one's commitment to an inner law written on the heart. Only true integration could heal the harm segregation had wrought on the American intersubjective landscape. According to King, segregation was an affront both to, quote, the sacredness of human personality and to the solidarity of the human family, end quote, because it dehumanized human beings and obstructed human relationships. As such, King maintained that segregation was a sin that, quote, scarred the soul of both the segregator and the segregated and was utterly unchristian, end quote. At the same time, King refused to believe the enemies, for example, the segregationists' evil acts deprived him of dignity, and he held that to be truly human, human solidarity must be universal, unconditional, and unrestricted, for we are all, quote, tied in a single garment of destiny, end quote. Ultimately, King sought what he called the beloved community, which emerges, quote, when the battle is over and a new love and a new understanding and a new relationship comes into being between the oppressed and the oppressor, end quote. Building this community depends on people's willingness to obey the unenforceable and so on transformed hearts. The question is how the conditions can be set for this transformation. Some of the conditions are set by physical proximity. Yet the barriers, quote, will be removed only as men are possessed by the invisible inner law which etches on their hearts the conviction that all men are brothers and that love is mankind's most potent weapon for personal and social transformation, end quote. What is needed is a way to reach hearts and remind people of their relatedness. For King, this way is nonviolence, especially the act of its willingness to suffer redemptively, and love even their enemies. Gandhi called his campaigns satyagraha, which means soul or truth force, and emphasizes the inherent difference between pacifism and active nonviolence. The force exercised in nonviolence is spiritual and moral, 
wherein people choose to be the recipients of suffering rather than inflict it in order to let truth rise to the surface. Unlike passivism, which is passive non-resistance to evil, Satyagraha is active non-violent resistance to evil. As King observes, quote, the non-violent strategy has been to dramatize the evils of our society in such a way that pressure is brought to bear against those evils by the forces of goodwill in the community and change is produced, end quote. These strategies include a willingness to suffer because when the injustice is deep, those benefiting from the injustice may retaliate. As King explains, quote, we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and national community, end quote. Elaborating on this point and defending the innocence of the activists, he writes, quote, nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open, where it can be seen and dealt with. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates. To the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. When civil rights activists were beaten, humiliated, and arrested, there was a triple negative exposure. The exposure of violence enforcing segregation laws, the exposure of the devaluation of human persons in these laws, and deliberate creative disruption of, quote, segregation spatial boundaries, end quote, in acts of civil disobedience like lunch counter sit-ins, which, quote, exposed segregation's deficiency as a regulative principle of community, end quote. However, as Pat Byrne explains, activist actions also convey positive dramatic meanings. There is a double positive revelation. First, their actions reveal them as human in their dedication to something more valuable than self-protection. These actions, quote, reveal persons as incarnate, originating values of justice and even redemption, end quote, which reveals both the activist's humanity and the depth of human freedom. In revealing their humanity, activists resist the disvalue assigned to them and offer the offender the gift of recognizing them as human. As womanist theologian and monitoring scholar M. Sean Copeland observes, quote, the praxis of presenting their very bodies in dramatic acts of civil disobedience envisioned a new so social imaginary that discredited the humiliating bodily habitus that segregation demanded of blacks and offered to whites a new image of intersubjective regard and respect, end quote. Importantly, presenting their black bodies deliberately in these ways resisted the oppressive gaze that sees the black body as, for example, an exotic object. Instead, they made visible through their bodies what had been invisible due to bias, the humanity of black people and the evil of segregation. Second, activists reveal themselves as friends, both in their willingness to suffer with and for the offended and their cause, and in their unwillingness to harm the opponent. They reveal themselves as friends of both the offended and the offender, making friendship visible. In the mediation of Christ in prayer, Lonergan explores the subjective application of mediator to Christ, by which he means that Christ is the mediator of something immediate in us, that is, in human subjects. 
Lonergan attends to two immediacies in human consciousness. First and primordially, there is the immediacy of ourselves to ourselves. As Pat Byrne explains, quote, we experience ourselves as given with and alongside whatever else we are conscious of, end quote. For example, we are present to ourselves along with the scent of ocean water. I am present to myself as smelling ocean water. This presence along with is what is, quote, elemental and primordial in the experience of being conscious, end quote. Lonergan identifies another immediacy within this primordial immediacy. Quote, supernatural realities that do not pertain to our nature, that result from the communication to us of Christ's life, end quote. Whereas the immediacy of ourselves to ourselves and consciousness is ours by nature, this other immediacy is ours by gift. This higher part of our reality that is somehow Christ's life is what Lonergan names religious experience, wherein our experience of being in love with God is being in love in an unrestricted fashion. While this experience is an experience of mystery, it is nevertheless, quote, a dimension in the experienced immediacy of oneself to oneself. It is the immediacy of oneself that is consciously experienced as being in love unconditionally, end quote. In other words, there is an immediacy of ourselves to ourselves in both the natural and supernatural orders. In the natural order, there is the immediacy of oneself as given to oneself, along with whatever else we are conscious of. In the supernatural order, there is the immediacy of oneself as given to oneself, along with the consciousness of being in love unrestrictedly. Yet these two immediacies are related. While the primordial immediacy is of ourselves to ourselves, we are given to ourselves through a variety of conscious activities, from experiencing, to understanding, to judging, to deciding, to loving. Further, there are distinct qualities of self-presence, according to what kind of activities we are performing. For example, my self-presence, along with my sense experience, is qualitatively distinct from my self-presence along with my deliberation about the value of some possible course of action. In religious experience, I am self-present along with my experience of being in love unconditionally, and so I am self-present at the height of human subjectivity. When, being, when speaking of being in love, in is understood in two ways for one of them. There are supernatural realities in the immediacy of ourselves to ourselves. For example, we are temples of the Holy Spirit, members of Christ, adoptive children of God the Father. We are also self-present in the supernatural experience of these realities. I am self-present to myself along with my experience of the gift of being the Father's daughter. This latter self-presence is what is relevant to the mutual self-mediation in the life of prayer. In addition to the immediacy of self-presence, there are questions about the person we freely will become, about what we will do with this natural gift of ourselves to ourselves. As Byrne explains, quote, Lonergan uses the term self-mediation to characterize the process by which we settle these questions of what we are to make of ourselves. By our acts of experience, understanding, judging, valuing, deciding, we are changing, making, and constituting the same self that is present as conscious in those very acts. That is what Lonergan means by self-mediation." There is no guarantee that our self-mediation will be authentic, for bias can derail the self-correcting process of learning and distort our feelings. The supernatural immediacy of God's love also needs self-mediation. The immediacy of God's love is mediated spontaneously whenever we do something by the grace of God. Additionally, quote, this life of grace within us 
can become a habitual, conscious living, end quote, such that we can easily revert to it and mediate it through the life of prayer. And this is Lonergan's focus in his 1963 lecture. In this case, there is, quote, a transition from the immediacy of spontaneity through the objectification of ourselves in acts. As Byrne explains, in prayer, people spontaneously use the same pattern of operations that they use in mediating the immediacy of themselves, end quote. Yet they here engage, quote, in the self-mediation of themselves as caught up in the immediacy of unconditional love, end quote. Through prayer, I mediate myself not only as a human made in the image of God, but also as a beloved daughter of the Father who calls me by name. Spiritual practices like St. Ignatius' spiritual exercises and the discernment of spirits make our prayerful mediation of this supernatural immediacy, again, my self-presence along with my experience of being God's beloved daughter, more deliberate. These practices help us mediate the immediacy of divine love according to our unique role in contributing to God's will for our incomplete universe. In this way, prayer is truly a self-mediation of the immediacy of God's love in us personally. He has called me by name to labor in the vineyard with him. As Byrne comments, quote, the habits of discernment developed through practicing Ignatius' spiritual exercises are the habits of reflectively mediating the immediacy of God's love and the immediacy of who I am and given to me. <coughs> in mediating those immediacies, I determine what I will make of the supernatural gift of myself to myself. Prayer is also a self-mediation through another. We are becoming ourselves in reference to Christ. In prayer, we are mediating Christ. Further, we mediate the whole Christ, which includes mediating the Christ who at once detested sin and was sorrowful for sin unto the point of death, and at the same time loved God and loved us while we were yet God's enemies. This self-reflective mediating of the immediate experience of unconditional love also occurs in nonviolence, particularly in the third step King notes in his 1963 letter that is the step of self-purification. In preparing for nonviolent action, activists undergo self-purification practices, including physical, external preparation, and internal, spiritual preparation. These interior practices work especially on what Byrne calls a feeling horizon, which is the assembled, interrelated totality of feelings as experienced by an individual subject. According to Byrne, quote, practices of self-purification are primarily practices that shift horizons of feelings toward making unconditional being in love and the unrestricted desire to know and value into the highest and central feelings throughout anyone's life, end quote. To undergo this shift is to develop what Byrne calls inner peace which is a matter of, quote, attuning one's feelings in accord with the unconditional loving that God is. For it is within God's unconditional love that all other feelings and values are ordered in the way God orders them, end quote. This attunement makes it possible for the activist to present her very body for her people, her cause, and even her so-called enemy. King recounts his own experience of inner peace amidst the threats he received during the Montgomery bus boycott. Ready to give up, he prayed to God. Quote, at that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never before experienced him. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth. God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to pass from me, 
The outer situation remained the same, but God had given me inner calm. I knew now that God is able to give us the interior resources to face the storms and problems of life." End quote. Nonviolent self-purification is a type of mutual self-mediation that mediates the immediacy of divine love because it is a deliberate and orderly communication of divine love into the human good of order. We're in the apex of this redemptive communication is what King calls unearned suffering. Self-purification begins with the mediation of divine life, love, into the lives of oppressors, or excuse me, into the lives of the oppressed turned activists, then extends to the mediation of this divine love into the lives of the oppressors, prompting penitence, and then lastly seeks res reconciliation. The gift of inner peace through practices of self-purification is essential to the orderly way in which nonviolence transforms evil into good. Quote, the nonviolent approach does not immediately change the heart of the oppressor. It first does something to the hearts and souls of those committed to it. It gives them new self-respect. It calls up resources of strength and courage they did not know they had. Finally, it reaches the opponent, and so stirs his conscience that reconciliation becomes a reality." End quote. In this way, the transformations of the oppressed and oppressor are linked, making their self-mediation truly mutual. We can observe this mutuality in King's writing, wherein he argues that nonviolence sets the conditions, quote, for the growing awareness on the part of respective opponents that mutually they confront the eternality of the basic worth of every member of the human family." End quote. It is this linked mutual self-mediation that sets the conditions for what King calls a double victory, where an activist win freedom for themselves and in the process win the opponent by appealing to their hearts through unearned suffering. While human dignity is a permanent divine gift, at the same time, a person's dignity is the value bestowed upon or denied to that person in the particular concrete network of personal relationships within which they live. In the segregated South, quote, black people were assigned a devalued personal value, which also affect in infected their valuation of themselves, end quote. King calls this devaluation a degenerating sense of nobodiness. People can overcome this degradation from their acceptance of God's valuation of them as persons. People can overcome, or excuse me, uh, in the context of the civil rights movement, this experience of their belovedness came especially in the context of African American churches. King regularly preached this reality reminding his fellow black persons of their somebodyness, as he liked to say. Engaging in nonviolent activism also helps activists restore their felt sense of their value. The journey of the oppressed toward rehumanization is enriched as the empowering Gandhian insight dawns on them. All power depends on cooperation, and we do not have to cooperate. Additionally, practicing nonviolent techniques and participating in nonviolent campaigns helps activists develop new images of themselves. This new, images, this new image is connected to their appropriation of God's valuation of their own self and their growing sense of empowerment. It is also connected to the way self-purification as a spiritual practice reconstitutes their feeling and value judgments about the other, that is, about the enemy neighbor. To come to value the opponent not as an evil person, not as an enemy per se, but rather as a human person and potential friend, can develop one's felt sense of one's own value. As activists change their stance toward the enemy neighbor, they might feel peace in achieving this hard-won value judgment. They might have, quote, feelings that feel the preciousness of human freedom, responding to its actualization in acts of choosing. End quote. In this case, the acts of choosing to forgive, love, and even suffer for the enemy neighbor. 
feeling one's human freedom exercised in the interpersonal context of reconciliation can be a profound way of feeling one's value. The activist decision about the enemy friend brings us to the next moment of the mutual self-mediation of unrestricted love and an essential moment of their self-purification, the decision to mediate themselves in reference to even the enemy neighbor as Christ mediated himself in reference to us while we were still sinners. Nonviolence involves deliberate inclusion of the enemy neighbor in one's self-mediation, which begins with reevaluating one's interpretation of and stance toward the enemy neighbor, and culminates in one's decision to consider what the enemy neighbor needs to authentically mediate God's love. An activist's consideration includes the insight that her unearned suffering can be redemptive. King deliberately helps activists shift their feelings and value judgments about the enemy neighbor in sermons such as Loving Your Enemies, offering this practical advice. You develop the capacity to love your enemy by developing the capacity to forgive him. <clears throat> King presents gospel meditations about the enemy neighbor that work on the feeling horizon of the activist, which help her feel the value of the enemy neighbor as a person, and feel compassion and forgiveness in preference to revenge or resentment and moral superiority. For example, King reminds us, the evil deed of the enemy neighbor never quite expresses all that he is that there is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. That there is something within human nature that can respond to goodness. And that even the worst segregationist can become an integrationist. Though the enemy neighbor's hate grows out of fear, pride, ignorance, prejudice, and misunderstanding, King pushes us to recognize that the enemy neighbor is not beyond love because, quote, we know God's image is ineffably etched in his being, end quote. Activists know this because of their own appropriation of God's valuation of them as persons, which included mediating the truly unrestricted nature of God's love into their concrete lives. As the activist's feeling horizon becomes attuned to the divine feeling horizon through self-purification, they cultivate compassion, feeling the value of the other person as more valuable than, for example, the value of repaying an injustice. In addition to developing a felt sense of their own personal value and that of the enemy neighbor, activists develop a sense of the value of the beloved community. As Byrne writes, quote, unrestricted being in love can ground the judgment of value and loving decision to embrace, in Shaler's words, all people who are felt as one, end quote. This value judgment participates in God's valuation of human solidarity and contributes to the nonviolent activist's deliberate inclusion of the enemy in her mutual self-mediation, such that her unearned suffering is both an act of solidarity with the offended and an offer of solidarity <coughs> to the offender. Nonviolence resists the devaluation of human persons and also goes a step further to reject the denial of human solidarity in its insistence on not mere desegregation but true integration. In summary, self purification in nonviolence helps activists develop a felt sense of their own dignity, the value of human solidarity, and the dignity of the enemy neighbor. According to Byrne, authentic responsibility, quote, depends profoundly upon living in authentic horizons of feelings, end quote. If the opponent's feelings are distorted, what gives the activists reason to hope for transformation? According to Byrne, quote, effective horizons are not so tightly regimented as it might seem at first. Horizons of feelings have internal tensions. Some feelings are at odds with others. Even a very vengeful person can have feelings of affection or even tenderness that intend contrary values, end quote. This felt tension is a principle of change and constitutes a certain kind of dynamism imminent in the feeling horizon. 
end quote, which involves a longing for inner peace. Within any person's horizon of feelings, there are two sources of this disequilibrium, the unrestricted desire to know and value everything about everything, and the basic fulfillment of this desire. As Byrne explains, quote, because both sources are unrestricted, both have the capacity to move a restricted and tension-filled horizon of feelings toward unconditional ordering and peace, end quote. These sources are the grounds of self-purification, and the nonviolent activist seeks to also liberate these sources in the lives of the opponents precisely by creating tension, externally in the economic and socio-political realm, and internally in the opponent's feeling horizon. The climatic dramatic moment of this tension occurs when activists, quote, present their very bodies, end quote, and appeal to the heart of the opponent through their voluntary, unearned suffering. Witnessing and even inflicting unearned suffering creates internal tension in the opponent's feeling horizon because the activist's suffering conveys both negative and positive dramatic meanings. This internal tension cries out for resolution toward inner peace. Ultimately, the objectivity of feelings and values is a matter of attuning feelings to the unconditional feeling horizon of God, which alone is capable of reconciling and ordering conflicting feelings. It was within this feeling horizon that Christ decided to take up the cross in prayerful consideration of us. As Lonergan observes of the cross, quote, it is the combination of love and deepest regret involved in a single situation about the same persons, end quote. Lonergan usually speaks of this regret as Christ's detestation of and sorrow over sin. Only the feeling horizon of God incarnate that in its unrestrictedness can feel this combination of love and detestation about the same situation and persons is capable of responsibly loving both one's friends and one's enemies and transforming evil into good through suffering. Christ incarnated this feeling horizon on the cross. Nonviolent activists deliberately seek to liberate their opponents from ignorance and bias by laying their case before the conscience of the community. In this way, like Christ, the nonviolent activists consider what the enemy needs to mediate himself authentically, namely to recognize the injustice for what it is through witnessing the suffering it causes and the violence at its core, and to value the humanity of the people it oppresses. The enemy friend also needs the assurance of a way out. This way out is not devoid of suffering, because suffering is part of the process of reconciliation. This suffering includes the recognition of a friend suffering, and especially a friend suffering for and because of me, such that the opponent is not without punishment. In short, the opponent needs to become penitent, willing to make amends and heal the harm. When we meditate on Christ's death and the reasons he endured it, we encounter ourselves in very difficult ways. Similarly, when opponents witness activists' unearned suffering and ask questions about why the activists sacrifice themselves, they encounter themselves in very difficult ways. They begin to understand that the activists sacrificed themselves for many related reasons. Out of solidarity with the oppressed, to put an end to the oppressed suffering, and to resist evil, because of their commitment to their cause, and even as an offer of solidarity and friendship to the oppressor. Christ's crucifixion dramatically expresses each of these meanings. Qua satisfaction, his crucifixion is an expression of the utmost detestation of and sorrow for sin, wherein he stands in every way with the offended. The cross is the eternal expression of the length to which God will go in order to restore broken community. And the cross communicates divine friendship to God's enemies. In these difficult cross-like encounters, conditions are set for oppressors to gradually withdraw from inauthenticities 
as they begin, for example, to have new insights into themselves and as their feelings begin to respond anew to memories of inauthentic actions with new feelings of shame and sorrow. In nonviolence, these encounters are mediated through the exposure of violence. Yet, as Byrne writes, there is also a liberating and securing encounter. We also encounter ourselves as loved unconditionally, even unto death. The unconditional love communicated in Christ's acceptance of death on our behalf reveals to us a love for us beyond all limits and frees us to recognize our inauthenticities and to begin to make restitution for them. King also highlights the centrality of unconditional love for personal transformation when he expresses the white man's need for the black man's love. Reminding us that it was while we were still sinners that we have the greatest need of God's redemptive love, King writes, quote, the black man must love the white man because the white man needs his love to remove his tensions, insecurities, and fears, end quote. Again, activists suffering dramatically reveals them as persons and even more so as friends. And this latter revelation frees opponents to recognize their inauthenticities. In mediating themselves in relation to the opponent, the nonviolent activist comes to realize that what the opponent needs is friendship. This friendship is communicated in the willingness to suffer and even die on the behalf of the enemy neighbor. Not only are the nonviolent activists' self purification and decisions truly instances of mutual self mediation, but their actions also set the conditions for the opponent to engage in genuine mutual self mediation. The enemy neighbor mediates himself authentically to the extent that his self mediation becomes truly mutual by at last considering the persons he formally disparaged. This is an opportunity to become more human because mediating themselves through previously disregarded persons allows for further relevant questions about ethical behavior to arise. Nonviolent activism helps opponents mediate the immediacy of the gift of unrestricted love by shedding light upon their contracted horizons, governing, governing their practical lives, and giving them a way out of these limited horizons by already offering forgiveness and friendship. Nonviolence helps mediate the immediacy of being in love unrestrictedly into human history by helping both the oppressed and the oppressor transcend their contracted horizons. It does so by creating conditions in which each is asked to mediate herself in relation to the other. Nonviolence facilitates and forces a mutual self-mediation among people who are spontaneously, legally, and spiritually separated from one another. Nonviolence mediates being in love unrestrictedly because it is unrestricted mutual self-mediation. The self-purification involved in nonviolence is an exceptional instance of mediating the immediacy of divine love precisely because of the form its mutuality takes, essential to their work of attuning their feelings to unconditional loving is a deliberate decision to include the enemy. Nonviolent activism is a form of mutual self-mediation, and it is truly mutual because it is in reference to others. This true mutuality is universal because it includes reference to even the so-called enemy and what he needs to attain his self-mediation. And so it sets the conditions for the enemy to embrace the same mutuality. Their self-purification practices imitate Christ's own mutual self-mediation in relation to us, whom he loved as friends though we were yet God's enemies. Like Christ, the nonviolent activist mediates herself in reference to others who are not only victims of sins, but perpetrators of sins. In this way, nonviolence is an act of solidarity and an offer of solidarity. To mediate oneself in a truly mutual way is the goal of the beloved community. Christ's mutual self-mediation includes not only his mediating himself in relation to us, 
but also his work to make our mutual self-mediation unrestricted in its mutuality, such that our mutual self-mediation approaches the unrestrictedness of divine love. This unrestrictedness is at once the goal and means of our mutual self-mediation. We cannot fully mediate the immediacy of divine love if we restrict our mutual self-mediation to referring to only these and not know those. For it is easy to love those who love you, as Luke the Evangelist reminds us. Nonviolent activism serves this universal mutual self-mediation through its orderly communication of God's love to the oppressed and oppressor alike, in which both sets of people are asked to mediate themselves in relation to one another. In this way, nonviolent activism sets the conditions not only for desegregation, mere physical proximity, but also for integration, true spiritual affinity, and the redemption of history. I close with a very moving and challenging passage from Dr. King. There will be no permanent solution to the race problem until oppressed men develop the capacity to love their enemies. To our most bitter opponents, we say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We cannot, in good conscience, obey your unjust laws, because non-cooperation with evil is as much of a moral obligation as cooperation with the good. Throw us in jail, and we shall still love you. Send us your hooded perpetrators of violence into our community at the midnight hour, and beat us, and leave us half dead, and we shall still love you. But be ye assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. One day we shall win freedom, but not only for ourselves. We shall so appeal to your heart and conscience that we shall win you in the process, and our victory will be a double victory. Love is the most durable power in the world. This creative force, so beautifully exemplified in the life of our Christ, is the most potent instrument available in mankind's quest for peace and security. Thank you, Dr. Floyd, for, for inviting me to do a uh, uh, response to uh, the presentation of Dr. Sanders. To you, Dr. Sanders, I thank you very much. And uh, I read your paper before now, and every line in that paper is very important. It's a dense paper, and I'm going to touch on the areas that are new to me, that I'm taking home. So, the first one is, I am amazed the way you weaved so many disciplines together. I hear you talk theology, philosophy, I hear you talk even psychology, and uh, my knowledge of diplomacy, I hear you also talk diplomacy. So. It is amazing, and like Dr. Floyd said in the introduction, you were able to bring two different personalities together in your work, and these are the authors that are very important to us here at City Hall, MLK and Lonegan. So in my observation, or in my response, the first thing I noticed is your careful explanation of the role of um, activists involved in activism, the role of the oppressed and that of the oppressor. And then you talked about the mutuality between the three. So this is new to me and I call it like a triangle. So why I say that it is new to me is in your word you said that the activists needs self-purification, first of all, in order to be successful. And the examples you gave is prayer, fasting, and meditation. Then on the part of the oppressed, you said it needs unrestricted love for the oppressor. 
And in your explanation, you said the oppressor needs what you called unrestricted mercy, both from the activist and from the oppressed. Then you went on to explain that what unites the triangle, the three of them, is what you called mutual self-mediation, or what you called enemy love genuine principles. So, and you go on to explain that these principles trans transcend both the oppressed and the oppressor. And in that process, what will come out of it is transformation of an unjust situation. So in other words, you are saying that Tivist must be super spiritual for uh, him or her to achieve non-violent activism, using the example of Ganda and that of MLK. Then you, you expressed on the part of the oppressed should be open and not to take really the oppression process personal because it is a reflection of the inner conflict in the life of the oppressor. So that is what the oppressor exhibits in the actions of oppression. And that is why you recommend that the oppressor needs unrestricted mercy. Then, another thing, this reminds me when you are talking of the inner conflict in the life of the oppressor, that reminds me of the line in the city of God of St. Augustine where he says, it is the iniquity on the part of the adversary that forces a just war on the wise. So, back to your triangle, you said when the oppressed, whom you refer to as victims, turned activists, mediate love and mercy, you say that the life that touches the life of the oppressor and prompts him or her to penitence and cause the oppressor to seek reconciliation. From my, this is new, your, uh, your theory of oppressor, oppressed relationship, which we all know is usually tense when that is happening. And even um, your uh, proposal is kind of uh, different from the usual. For example, you know the book of Paulo Freire, the pedagogy of the oppressed. He described the class of oppressor as unrepentant, kind of. So he says, it happens, however, that as they cease to be exploiters or indifferent spectators, or simply the heirs of exploitation, and move to the side of the exploited, they almost always bring with them the marks of their origin. Their prejudices and their deformations, which include the lack of confidence in people's ability to think, to want, and to know. So, in other words, the oppressor remains the oppressor. My question now is the application of your proposal in the real world. That's why I'm asking you, using Ukraine and Russia as an example, the two countries that are Christian, at least the majority, how will your theory of enemy love genuine principle be applied in a situation like this? Because I think during Christmas celebration, uh, it was on the news that Putin offered the ceasefire in order to allow both Christians in the two countries to celebrate the birth of Christ. And the answer was no from Zelensky, saying that it was a way that Putin wanted a break in order to regroup his military force. 
So, that in a Christian, I wouldn't even talk of uh, like Africa where you have Muslims and Christian uh, conflict that is tense, that wouldn't uh, be a possibility. Then my second question will be, in your analysis of the idea of activist, oppressed, and oppressed of triangle, are you excluding the traditional mediation process that a mediator can be invited from nowhere, not interested in, the, uh, in any of the parties, not taking part because your explanation is that the activist will take part, takes interest. But in the traditional way of alpha mediation, there is no interest of the piece of the practitioner. He just invited or even paid to come mediate between conflict and will do his or her job and leave. So where in your analysis, where do you still we do we still need the traditional mediation process and the and the mediator? Thank you. somewhat famously set the value of straight insights at a dime a dozen. <laughs> but when you discover that not only did an insight of your own occur to someone else independently, but to someone whose thinking you hold in high regard, as has been my opinion of Dr. Sanders for going on a decade now, well suddenly that twelfth of a dime you picked up somewhere along the way transforms into a pearl of wisdom. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. is still at Birmingham Jail must be among the finest expressions of American moral reflection and exhortation. I try to wedge it into as many of my courses as I can, driving down the probability that students will leave university without having read it. In one course, I had it stuffed in between Simone Weil's little letter <coughs> on the value of academic study as preparation for prayer and Sarah Copley's essay about teaching contemplative prayer in a Boston jail. Nestled between these, it occurred to me that the practices of self-purification King described, nonviolent activists engaging in, had a prayer-like function and structure. Analogous to how Lonergan describes the theoretical enterprise, they all involve a withdrawal from praxis for the sake of praxis, an attunement to and discernment of one's own heart, as well as a clear-eyed attention to reality on reality's own terms. I had not, however, made the connection to the matter of mutual self-mediation between persons. And I'm grateful to Dr. Sanders for the significant enrichment. It, it helps to concretize, even dramatize, something in Lonergan's method and theology that for a long while puzzled me. There, Lonergan expounds a hierarchical scale of value, sometimes I call the scale of value preference, running from vital values like food through social values like the economies that make food readily and regularly available, to cultural values like haute cuisine and the restaurant criticism that reflects on it. But then the scale takes what was to me a puzzling turn after pivoting from particular vital values to the, good of or the goods of order that make them recurrent, to the shared meanings and values that charge them with the full drama of human living, then honoring its stacks personal values that value that each unique person is. And he puts those on top of social and cultural values. For some time, it seemed to me like the value of persons is something that should be fit into and under their arrangements in societies and cultures, that society will just sort of wrap around the person and goes beyond them, or even sort of aggregates of persons or something. Then, you can go ahead and stack religious value on top of all of that to this sort of sacred canopy envelop enveloping this sort of succession of concentric circles. But Lonergan doesn't do this. His scale goes vital, social, cultural, then personal, then religious value. The same anticipation behind my past puzzlement at Lonergan's scale of values can also lurk in the way we think about activism, about our participation in the joint pursuit of justice. It can be easy to imagine that once we have patched up the 
cruel stupidities in our technological, economic, and political orders, the work of the activist is complete. You pass the law, the executive signs it, activism complete. Or perhaps some particularly ambitious activists might also want to change the culture so that we live together in and through more credible beliefs according to more worthwhile values. But if one scale of values is correct, the pursuit of social values and cultural values is fit into a wider and higher task, facilitating and realizing the value that each unique person is. As Mr. Rogers reminded his television neighbors, <laughs> there's no one else in the whole world just like them, and they make every day in our world a special day just by being themselves. And so perhaps maybe we can think of the preparatory self-purification as a purification of our attention of everything but clear-eyed perception of this irrepra irreplaceable worth. But that's the withdrawal from practicality is, for, is to, by various methods, appreciate um, the infinite love of God saying yes to that you exist at all. And then to return to practice to offer that worth to the neighbor even when the neighbor is an enemy. And very much as the path to personal values passes through adequately realized vital social and cultural values, so, because of Christ's explicit identification of himself with the least of these in Matthew 25, our realization of religious values, our mediation of the glory of God, must pass through the mutual mediation of the personal value that each of us is. But first of all, with those whose personal dignity we have not just neglected to foster, but in so very many ways worked to dissolve. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, quote, God has so constructed the body as to give greater honor to a part that is without it, so that there may, may be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. Mutuality of concern, you might say. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it, if one part is honored, all share its joy. In the context of Dr. Sanders' lecture, this solidarity of the body, Christ's body, in suffering, in honor, and in joy, suggests just the sort of Christological connections she, through Lonergan and King, has exposited for us this afternoon. Christ's passion is the incarnation site of greatest density, so to speak and therefore also a paradigm of that through which our solidarity, first with God, but also with one another, will have to pass. But in the, con in the, in the context of 1 Corinthians, St. Paul is rather famously talking about spiritual gifts and the pneumatological ground of our solidarity in Christ's body. Dr. Sanders' lecture hardly excluded the mission of the Holy Spirit, but it appears largely in Lonergan's transposed language, unrestricted being in love. Those familiar with Methodist theology will know that Father Lonergan invoked Romans 5.5, 5, the gift of God's love poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, to illustrate that notion. But others might have missed the illusion. So I wonder, uh, accordingly, if Jen would fill in some of the rest of the Trinitarian picture for us. In particular, to say something about how the mission of the Spirit is coordinated with the mission of the Word when thinking about the theology of nonviolence. One avenue, I suspect, is through the notion of a law written on our hearts, in the language of Jeremiah 31, and its correlate, that obligation that cannot be enforced. But I'd be grateful for whatever angle on the subject, Dr. Sanders. Thanks for coming. That education was negotiation. Um, when negotiation failed, uh, the, the next thing they would do is seek what he calls direct action or nonviolent activism. But that's the fourth step. The third step is self-purification. If negotiation fails, they have to undergo self-purification um, before engaging in nonviolent activism um, in that particular, whatever particular context. But the goal of all four steps is to bring people to the negotiating table. Um, so nonviolent activism, as King understands it, um, is a way, again, of creating such tension that the, the um, 
you can't ignore it any longer, and so you have to start talking about it. And it, and it does put, he actually, uh, when he was first called uh, to this kind of work uh, at the Montgomery bus boycott, he, he sat for a while with the, the ethics of what they were doing there. Um, he wasn't convinced yet um, about a boycott because it would cause economic suffering. And he was wrestling with to what extent can we impose suffering on other people. Eventually he, um, as we all know, the, the history, um, engaged in it. Um, but there, there is an, an intention to, to put pressures so that people are forced more or less to deal with things. And so the negotiation comes back and that's where there would be room. I, I would certainly not exclude a, like a third party, right? But, but they've got to set the conditions to make that something that both parties are genuinely open to, right? He goes to jail in Birmingham because they had negotiations and then the people didn't live by the, the negotiations and so they went back to the drawing table. Um, as for uh, Ukraine and Russia, um, there's, well, there, one helpful distinction is there's there's nonviolence as a way of life, which is the way King and Gandhi practiced it. There's also nonviolence as a tactic. And this, if you're familiar with the, the name Jean Sharp, um, he did a lot of research on the role of nonviolent activism um, in most of the 20th century, but throughout history, and he discovered at the time, it was 198 methods that people would use for nonviolent activism that could overthrow even dictatorships. Right? It's really fascinating research. Um, so there's that distinction, and I think, but even in the, for people like King and Gandhi who practice it as a way of life, there's room for the possibility of something like a just war, right? Um, so there's movements in the Catholic Church now to move from just war theory to just peace theory. Um, and there's a question, the extent to which just peace theory uh, excludes the possibility of just war altogether, or whether it's a shift in emphasis on looking for ways to justify war toward looking for ways to other creative ways to respond to problems. Um, I think uh, we, we have to leave the possibility of, of just war open because we have an obligation, like King says, a moral obligation to resist evil, and, and sometimes um, there are things we might need to do in that regard. So it, it's much harder uh, for nonviolent activism, like when the war has already started, what, what you do in that context. I, I would suggest there's actually really interesting stories about uh, World War II and various pockets of nonviolent activism, uh, like the White Rose resistance, um, that, that people still engaged in these kinds of things, um, even if they couldn't, uh, even if they didn't engage on it in a wholesale way, um, still pockets of, of hope for this kind of thing, but I think um, you probably have more in the diplomatic set, uh, set, um, area than I do to, to think of these things, but, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's much harder, I think, when the wars have already started and when we're already in the midst of that. Um, but to, to look for opportunities, I think. And I think one thing with nonviolence, too, is um, sometimes when we, when we look at very big problems, um, like this war that we're, we're considering, it, it can act as a barrier to considering creative ways in which, in smaller situations where something like this may actually be a possibility. Right? Um, so that's, that's the best I can do with the war. Um, can, can, I, can, I ask a, can I ask a, a follow-up question about um, just a textual thing that I think you might know, and I, I have the vaguest memory of it, but in, I think in, in Tom, St. Thomas's treatment of just war, doesn't he, I, I, I think I'm right, so I can tell me how, uh, that it's not licit to, even, even when fighting, it's not licit to hate your enemy, even in those circumstances. So the spiritual task would be cognate, right? That there would have to be some kind of spiritual preparation to like go to battle but not hate the people who are shooting you when you're shooting back. That's right. Yeah, yeah. There's still that internal um, obligation, so to speak, to to not reduce the other. Uh, especially the, part of that's right because like the soldier may or may not have anything to do with the larger problem, and you have to.
Um, so you have to undergo that kind of thing as well, which, um, yeah. Um, the, um, the Trinity, and John, I love, uh, I love your explanation of the, the scale, because I had always myself struggled with the personal value. Like, how do we explain what's going on here? And I think your way of putting what we're doing here today in, in the context of that was very helpful. Um, the, so the Trinity, you know, one thing that's interesting, uh, like, like Dr. Eve said, Romans 5.5 5 is Lonergan's go-to for the, um, the mission of the spirit in the human heart, the invisible mission of the, the spirit. Um, and I, I emphasize in my paper Romans 5.8, which is um, that God loved us, or Christ loved us while we were still enemies, while we were still sinners. Um, and I, I, there, behind the scenes, there was a little effort there between 5.5 five and 5.8 five to, to bring the missions together a little. Um, the, uh, so certainly, like, like Dr. Hoop said, the unrestricted being in love is, is Lonergan's way of expressing the gift of the Spirit, the mission of the Spirit. Um, I, I think maybe a way to think about this in the context of nonviolence is that um, well, one, like, like Dr. Hube said, we can go the route of the, um, the inner law uh, that Jeremiah talks about and that King uh, is referring to. Um, I also i am reminded of uh, Charles Heffley, a Lonergan scholar, who speaks, he, he uses this analogy for the spirit um, in the inter-Trinitarian relations as, as gratitude, um, the sort of grateful listening to the word that the, um, that the Father speaks. Um, and I, I think maybe I'd run with that. Um, and you know, it, when I came here, I was I went to the library, uh, and it, you've got that sort of circular dome with various um, passages. And I, I took a picture because I was so excited. Um, there was a, a passage from Aquinas, which comes from Augustine, about that the word is not the word of the Son is not just any word, but the word that breaks forth into love. And this is Aquinas' way of speaking of the procession of the Spirit. And um, it's, it's, it's important because, as, as Augustine says, we're not talking about just any word here. Um, it's not just like the word I speak when I understand something. It's the word I utter in, in an experience of great love. And so, you know, uh, it's, uh, I, I'm reminded of, like, even the demons, and, and the demons first they're usually the first to know Christ, to know who Christ is. That's not the kind of knowledge we're talking about. Even the demons do that. We're talking about knowledge with love. Right? What does it mean to know God with love? Right? This is a whole other way of engaging um, who God is. And, and the way we generate not just knowing Christ um, sort of intellectually, but knowing Christ... Um, with existentially, like as a whole person, um, I, I'm reminded of, um, I was talking about the spiritual exercises, one of uh, the exercises toward the end is um, what Ignatius calls the contemplation to gain love. And he, um, he leads you through, you're supposed to contemplate and germinate on all the ways in which God loves you. And he starts by saying, you know, like, let's think generally, like maybe go to the Psalms and think about the ways that God, uh, God is a creator and a redeemer. Ignatius is all about like seeking God as one who's laboring in the world. And then from there, from that general understanding of God as creator and redeemer, go personal. Get, get personal about your own salvation history and contemplate all the ways in which God loves you in particular. And he wants you to do this so that you generate gratitude. And the reason he wants you to generate gratitude is not only because gratitude is good in itself, because he wants you from the place of gratitude to then go and love others the way God has loved you. That's the point of the contemplation of gain love. It's not so I can feel love. It's to gain charity, the, the supernatural love, to then mediate it to the rest of those around you. And so that, that's kind of how I see the spirit at work here, right? Where the, the, the nonviolent activist, it, it's born in some way from an act of gratitude for the, the sense of being loved and healed in, the, in that way. 
um, and, and wanting that for, for other people who are in the same situation, segregated in that way, and even for, as I, as I, I said, the enemy neighbor, that's King's way of speaking. He never just says enemy, it's always enemy hyphen neighbor. Gandhi's similar, he, always, he never says enemy, he always says so-called enemy. Right? They're very particular about how they speak about the, the other here. Um, so that, that's where I'd see, I think, the Trinity is, the United Nations way. Yes, we have a few minutes for questions from the floor.